Chu. My name is Ayatsukam. I come from the Ihadasat tribe, one of the tribes that make up the New Chalmuth nation. The dance that you have just seen is called Hinkeats. This dance, the song and the headdress, belong to the Tokwat chiefs. The Tokwat are also one of the tribes of the New Chalmuth. This dance can only be performed by certain people and only during certain ceremonies. Today, all of these ceremonies are known as potlatch. This comes from the word pachil, which means to give. In our language, each ceremony has its own name. Our culture is filled with songs, dances, masks, and curtains, which have been passed on from one generation to the next by oral teaching or word of mouth. In this program, you are going to see how two tribes of the New Chalmuth people are using oral history and the science of archaeology to reconstruct what life was like for our ancestors. In our society, the speaker is a very important person. He not only speaks for the chief, but is also a historian for the tribe. Let me introduce you to Uu Mahanis, speaker for the Tokwat chiefs. And standing beside me, Chief Itzkisap, one of the great chiefs of once a great nation, Tukwat, a man who holds the highest position in any language, a great monarch, Chief Itzkisap and his family were proud owners of many rich areas and rivers. The land on which his great longhouse is situated. He has 54 wolves as part of his powers. 54 wolves, which you will see as you enter the great house. They belong to the chief. You'll see part of his kingdom, the other power that he's got, what he's so named after, Teach Kisab, which is part of the great Thunderbird. As you can see, the Tukwat people have a detailed knowledge of their territory, or Hahosi, and the symbols of chieftainship. But the traditional villages with the dugout canoes and big houses no longer exist. Many of the masks and other historical spiritual items are in museums and private collections all over the world. How long have we been here and what was life like for our ancestors? Oral history can provide us with part of the picture and the science of archaeology can help fill in some of the blanks. With the help of a group of archaeologists, Chief Ditzkitzap is attempting to reconstruct what life would have been like in the village of Tukwa. We uh, got talking about what what life must have been, and I mentioned we uh, we have these uh, village sites, and uh, this happened to be one of the main ones of the Tukwa people, and. Uh, what, what I really want to know, and if, if there's any way of finding out, which I know Dennis is, is going to be able to, to find the, the uh, length of time our, our people have been here. This is the, the, the main information I'm really looking for. If you excavate, you're doing it with a mason's trowel. You're being, you're, you know, you're doing it fairly carefully, trying to find everything what we say in situ, which means in the spot that it was left when whoever left it or lost it or whatever. And uh, 
artifacts are all measured in three-dimensionally, but the faunal remains too, all the, the bones, the shell, etc., all the leftover of, the, of meals over countless generations are collected. I mean, you're collecting and keeping all that faunal stuff. And as a backup, as you're trawling in the dustpans, dumping it into the shovels, and then you take it to the screens and you sift it so that anything that you've missed by going too fast or because it's very small, you get a second chance in the screens and everything collected all the screens comes back to level bags because as we go down and as we go down in depth we're just not collecting all the bones and putting them into heat because then you wouldn't be able to see any changes you wouldn't be able to do any you know any analysis in any kind of scientific uh, manner so every 10 centimeters we 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 all the fall remains from those 10 centimeters are kept separate and it's all labeled as to where it came from so that in a sense you can almost reconstruct the site for every day you put in here, you put days in the lab, you know, so you're talking months, years of, of working at it. But you, you look for those, the jigsaw puzzle, it's like having a, a big jigsaw puzzle with a thousand pieces and 945 are missing. And you got 55 and you try to make sense, and you put them there and you think, what is this? What is this picture I'm supposed to be looking at? And that's archaeology. This is how some of the material looks once it's sorted. When it first comes into the lab, we're in bags like these. The material's essentially loose, but it's labeled by site and by level where it comes from. Once we get things into the lab, everything has to be cataloged. It's cleaned up, it's washed, some preliminary repairs, if necessary, are made. And then each of the pieces has an identifying label put on. Perhaps you can see on this one, for instance, that it identifies the site and it'll have an artifact number so we can retrieve all the information that's associated with it. As we excavate uh, down in these units, it really is like going back in time. You're peeling away layers and each layer takes you down successively older and older occupations of that site. So when we remove each layer, we carefully record everything that was in it. We keep all the animal uh, uh, bones and other, anything else that represents human presence at the site, people's activities while they were there. We keep those bagged separately for each layer and then start over again for the next layer. And when we're done, when we're down at the bottom of the pit, we've reached bedrock or the old beach line, and we can say we are now finished. We're below the first location that anyone was ever living on this site. Then we can look at the walls of the excavation units and see a record of people's past in the layers that are on those walls. So those are photographed, they're drawn, uh, we keep a good record of those, and that's our knowledge of, of changes over time really comes through that. Uh, it's called the stratigraphy. It's a vital part of how we order everything else that came out of the pits in terms of the record of over time. So the picture is becoming more and more clear. We know from archaeology that our people have been here for thousands of years. We also know quite a bit about how people lived through our oral history. The most southern tribe of the Nuchalneth Nation is the Macaw. It is actually located in the United States. About 500 years ago, there was a catastrophe at the Macaw village of Ozette. The side of a cliff above the village caved in, burying several houses. Because of the nature of the soil and the fact that it was soaked with water, the site was perfectly preserved. In 1970, when the excavation began, the archaeologists were amazed at what they found. Artifacts from wood, cedar bark, and other material that would have long since decomposed were perfectly preserved. 
This has become one of the most important archaeological sites in North America. For the Macaw people, it was a unique opportunity to take their own knowledge of history and combine it with what the archaeologists found. The result is the Macaw Cultural and Research Center located in Nia Bay, Washington. Thinking about this collection and uh, OZ and uh, what it meant to our people, and, uh, the site is really a gift. To, to us, you really begin to see that when you, when you look at the collection, you can see that there are things that we have been told traditionally, orally, since we was little, that, that happened. And you kind of come through this exhibit, you come look at the artifacts and you see that Everything that we is, we've been told is represented somehow in, in the collection. Uh, for instance, there, um, I was curious myself because uh, I'm a younger man about harpoon heads when I was when I was oh, about 18. And I asked, I said, "What did they use before metal?" Because almost the ones I've seen were metal. Any of my great grandfathers at whaling gear, they all had metal harpoon heads. And I was wondering what they used before that. And, and I was told that they used mussel shell. And why? Wow, here, out of this site, here it is mussel shell, you know. And the fishnet, you know, saved us. Uh, there was a, uh, in a court case, they, people, white people said we never had no nets, you know, so you can't fish with uh, nets, you have to use your traditional gear and here out of the ground is a fish net. And, and it's kind of like our book, you know, these things. It, it, just, it just puts a seal of approval on our oral history. We looked at this as a grandparent and, and not for this generation, but generations and generations and generations to come. we were given a curtain which belonged to some of our relatives from across Canada there. And our way of knowing who our relationship is, relation is and how our relationship started was through gifts sometimes that you keep and also songs that we get and uh, our curtains. This is how we were told, orally, orally, every single day. And that was all. We had another man who came from another tribe and came and sat with my father and another one from a different tribe, making this tight so that you couldn't say, no, that's not the way it was. One tribe here, one tribe here, and one other tribe here learning like my dad had to do. That's how, how oral the Indians were, very, very oral and also thorough. They never left anything out. Shua? Back at the site of the ancient village site of Tupua, you can almost feel the presence of the relatives of our ancestors who once lived here. As we look down on the ancient canoe slip, it is not hard to hear the drums and see the images of the past. <laughs> 